Hello and welcome to another episode of Factor Film. This time I'm going to be looking at Deep Impact. Uh, as a film, it wasn't actually that good, but it does actually look at some of the science fairly accurately, with of course your usual Hollywood exaggerations, which of course I will analyze in this film. This video is probably my least favorite to make, but I still really enjoyed making it, and I hope you really enjoy watching it. Anyways, without any further ado, here is Deep Impact. My first bone to pick with this film is in the first few sequences. It's a little shot, but it kind of impacts the whole film. When our resident astronomer, Dr. Wolf, uh, looks up the coordinates that Biederman sends him, he finds a comet there. He punches in some stuff, and his computer poops out some stuff on his screen that really freaks him out. Velocity in relation to the sun is 26 miles per second. Let's just think about that number a bit. First, let's put it into a proper format, 41.84 kilometers per second. Now this part is rough, but it gives us an idea. We can see in this little diagram, the computer also spits out, the comet is currently somewhere just out past the orbit of Mars, and that it has to swoop in, orbit the sun, and head back out, and then it will intersect with Earth. The average distance between Mars and the Sun is 9.55 AU. We can safely assume that this distance is shorter than what the distance would be for the comet to do its orbit and impact Earth. If that's the case, and the film is about two years till the comet strikes Earth, then something's not adding up. At 41.84 kilometers per second, the comet would have traveled 2,320,000,000 kilometers or 17.6 astronomical units, which is 1.84 times the orbit of Mars. As you can tell, that means the comet would have hit long before they say it does in the movie. This doesn't even consider that the comet would speed up as it approaches the Sun, so essentially a conservative estimate. Although it only took about 4 seconds of screen time, so not exactly a huge flaw in the film. But the comet we discovered is the size of New York City from the north side of Central Park to the Battery, about seven miles long. Put another way, this comet is larger than Mount Everest. It weighs 500 billion tons. So it's seven miles in diameter, or about 11 kilometers, and has a mass of 500 billion tons. That puts it at just a little smaller than the smaller of Mars's two moons, Deimos. That's not really relevant, but it's a fun comparison. How does the explanation of the comet impact compare with what actually happened in reality? He gave us a lot of info. Much of it is actually correct. Ish. Let's start with the bigger of the two. Actually, no. Let's start with how they ended up with two in the first place, because that's just silly. First off, they got it right that detonating a nuclear device inside the comet would most likely only break off a chunk and not do much else. I just don't believe that the United States would actually try that because, yeah, it's such an obvious outcome that the dudes at NASA would have definitely informed the government blowing stuff up usually does not work. That does seem to be the attitude of the states, but I'd like to give them some credit. I think they would have used something else to get the job done. Gravitational tractor is a really cool option. Okay, back to the smaller of the two. The ever-reassuring Morgan Freeman tells us that the tsunami will be traveling at a speed of 1100 miles an hour, or 492 meters per second, which is 1.45 times the speed of sound at sea level. There is a very simple formula to calculate the speed of an ocean wave, which is this, is essentially tied to the depth of the water. Even at the deepest part of the ocean, Challenger Deep, the wave would still only travel at 328 meters per second or 0.96 the speed of sound. The Atlantic is nowhere near that deep, so the tsunami would only travel at around 200 meters per second in the Atlantic, which isn't quite the supersonic speeds that they describe in the film, but, I mean, that's still the speed of most passenger jets, which is crazy fast for a wave. I don't have the means, I'm no expert in fluid dynamics, to figure out the size and speed of the wave as it approaches the shore, but Mr. Freeman is correct in saying that it will be bigger and slower as it approaches the shore. So he isn't that far off. He got the gist right. Big wave. A little too speedy, but big wave. Let's look at what the big chunk would do to Earth. Obama, <clears throat> Freeman, 
kind of glosses over this, which surprises me, especially considering the insane numbers involved with something that big, traveling that fast, slamming into Earth. He just focuses on the aftermath, which, to be fair, he does explain fairly accurately, aside from some few minor details, which I'll get back to. But first, I want to focus on the initial impact. According to the movie, it will impact Western Canada. That's where I'm from. By my home. Upon initial contact, the comet, going at 42 km per second, will start to smush up against the Earth, compressing itself, as well as the rock below it. As the rear portion of the comet is still moving towards the planet, the comet will continue to compress until it reaches crazy high density. At this point, it essentially explodes, vaporizing itself along with a chunk of the Earth approximately the same volume as the comet. The energy released from this blast would be the equivalent to 100 million megaton nuclear bombs. All that energy creates a huge crater. The blast would initially excavate a crater approximately 100 kilometers in diameter and 25 to 34 kilometers deep. All the rock and debris would be sent flying up and away from the crater. A good amount of it would have enough energy to be sent into orbit, but the majority of it would fall back down to the Earth, extending outward from the crater. For a little perspective, the crust in that part of the world is only between 35 and 45 kilometers thick so it would almost break through the Earth's crust. Not to mention, the rock beneath the crater would be highly brecciated with many cracks and fissures. This massive compression would likely induce pools of molten rock to surface on the bottom of the crater. Talking about cracking open a gate to hell. Those pools wouldn't be there long though, as a crater of that size on Earth would be unstable, and the walls would slump into the crater floor once the pressure from the blast faded creating a shallower, but wider yet, crater. As I'm sure most of you aware, nuclear blasts tend to create a lot of heat. This would be the same here. The energy intensity from the blast would quickly propagate outwards from the crater, scorching everything in its path. The energy would dissipate as it expanded, but not before torching much of the Canadian and American countryside. But not to worry, the expanding shockwave would put out most of those fires. This shockwave would be strong enough that your eardrums would likely burst at only 1,000 kilometers away, registering at approximately 163 decibels. At 10,000 kilometers away, it would still be 129 decibels, enough for you to notice your eardrum flexing. And even at 20,000 kilometers away, which is the opposite side of the globe, the sound would still register at 122 decibels. That's like being at a loud rock concert. Your ears would hurt. The exact long-term effects are a little hazy, pun intended, but the direct results are fairly well understood. All the stuff excavated by the explosion, including all the ash and soot, would deposit their energy into the atmosphere, heating up the local atmosphere in the area. As things start to settle down, the temperatures start to drop, and quickly. Because all the ash would be suspended in the atmosphere, very, very little light would actually make it down to the Earth's surface and you'd end up with a Game of Thrones many year winter. Except with hopefully less of these jerks running around. So Morgan Freeman is fairly correct saying that plants will die with the animals following shortly afterwards. Except not all would. Chemotrophs, or chemotrophs, I don't really know how to say that, unlike phototrophs, are organisms that get their energy from oxidization reactions, so they don't need any sunlight. Many seeds would survive and germinate once the skies have cleared. There are also many insects and other creatures that have similar dormant stages to the flora. Individual species are pretty fragile, and they die off pretty easy. But life itself, that's pretty damn hard to kill. It would definitely be an extinction level event. But in the words of Jeff Goldblum, Life, uh, finds a way. Yeah, it's probably a satellite. Probably satellite? That instructor should know that a satellite would be moving. Unless it was geostationary, in which case it's so far from Earth that you couldn't see it with your eye. Good old floppy drive. <laughs> Why is he in such a rush? The thing won't hit for another two years, according to the movie, so really, he can afford to be a little slower and safer. Cars don't do that, they don't explode. What the hell is this? I think some sirens and some lights would have been sufficient to pull her over. 
What do you know about Ieli? I know you should have picked a better cover story than a sick wife. Again, I call BS. They would never codename it to Ellie, or E-L-E, it's just stupid. I woke up this morning and I realized none of you want me here. This scene is just another Hollywood drama scene. Any team attempting to do this would have no internal strife and would work fantastically together. They would have been put through months of training to make sure that the team worked coherently as one unit. That program was called Orion. Now, with the help of Russian engineers, a technology designed to propel weapons of mass destruction will power the ship that will intercept the greatest threat our planet has ever faced. Project Orion. Actual mission proposed to use nuclear explosions to propel a spacecraft. Not to be confused with NASA's current Orion mission, which is to go to Mars. If you have a sec, read the wiki page on it. It's an insanely awesome idea. You could fly the coma just fine. Things only move if they're acted upon. What would push those big chunks off the comet? A real dust tail has particles the size that we would find in smoke, small enough to be pushed by the sun. Not these giant house-sized things. So, yeah, nah. The Philae lander on Rosetta also used a grappling hook landing system. How are they pushing the drill into the comet without pushing themselves off the comet? It's not that big of a comet. It would have gravity, but it would be very minimal. Ha! Star Wars screens. The astronaut should not be this lost in public. I had that globe as a kid! How many nukes we have left in that? Four. Okay, if we can get the remaining bombs in that vent, there shouldn't be anything left of that comet bigger than a suitcase. Four nukes won't do it if the last four also failed. All that material and little comets would still impact the Earth and have some dire consequences. Just look up the Tunguska event. It flattened 2,000 square kilometers of forest and was only somewhere between 60 and 190 meters in diameter. Or Chelyabinsk. Had that been a direct hit, it could have destroyed a city of 1 million people and it was only 20 meters across. Well, that about wraps it up. If you liked it, please like it with a click as well as just a mental like. And also please subscribe to my channel for more awesome sciencey reviews. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.